So, uh, Marvel kind of sucks now, right? Okay, let me explain. I loved the Infinity Saga of Marvel Cinematic Universe, and the final Avengers films had me in tears. It tied up big plots and character arcs after hours and hours of movies and stories. It felt just as huge as an ending of that size should be. It was brilliant. The Infinity Saga wasn't perfect, there are some characters I don't care for as much as others, and some of the films were pretty meh, but as a whole I can confidently say I enjoyed or loved more films than I didn't like. And that's a whopping 23 movies, by the way. After Endgame, a lot of people were done with Marvel, which is fair enough. Following Marvel films is a big time commitment, and there were plans to make it an even bigger commitment with expanding into television alongside even more movies and characters. These fans could end their time with Marvel on a high note with Endgame. A great conclusion to a great saga of movies. But there were persistent fans, myself included, who were excited for the next phase of movies announced. Phase 4. Oh, and I'll be talking spoilers for Phase 4 up to Thor Love and Thunder for films, and up to Ms. Marvel for TV shows. So if you haven't seen any of those, I'll add timestamps to the video's description so you can jump to the next one in the series. Part 1. The Movies Before I jump in, I know, I know, technically WandaVision came first, TV kicked off Phase 4. However, I'm starting with the movies because that's where Marvel's biggest mainstream audience is. It's really only the hardcore fans or casual subscribers of Disney Plus that watch the television shows. And even then, you don't necessarily need to watch the television shows to watch the Marvel movies. Or at least, you shouldn't have to. So the movies are for the big moments, for the biggest characters and the biggest impacts on the MCU. And the movies kicked off with... Black Widow. Ouch. This one hurt me. As I mentioned in my first Scarlet Witch video, Plans for a Black Widow movie had been in the works for years. Then its release was delayed another year by a global pandemic. So the hype was real when it came to seeing what story would finally bring her solo debut to life. Black Widow follows THE Black Widow on a journey into her past, set between Captain America Civil War and Avengers Infinity War. During this time, the family that Natasha was undercover with when she was a child is thrown back together to take down the man who created the Red Room, the place that made Natasha into the Black Widow. The film started well enough. Young Natasha's idyllic home life is revealed to be an undercover mission that ends in an intense escape from America and return to the brutality of the Red Room that would make Natasha the skilled assassin we know today. The problem with this opening is that it makes the audience believe we are getting a slick, intense spy thriller. Something akin to Winter Soldier, but maybe more intense and dark. Which is exactly what a Black Widow film should be. She's a secret spy assassin, not a biologically altered superhero after all. Right? So, what's the deal with Budapest? first mentioned in Avengers 2012. Just like Budapest all over again! You and I remember Budapest very differently. There's been a build-up, and Natasha mentions multiple times that... I got red in my ledger. I'd like to wipe it out. So there needs to be a satisfying payoff for this incredibly dark implication and story. And then we find out Natasha feels bad because murdering the very evil leader of the Red Room, she also killed his daughter as collateral damage. That is the huge trauma that has followed her for years. I mean, sure, murdering an innocent child isn't something to be proud of, by any means, but this was in order to kill her very not-innocent dad, who was murdering many other children and people. This just feels weak as a payoff to a years-long mystery. Then, it turns out both of them want even dead. And you check the body? Confirm the kill? There was no body left to check. Are you serious? 
This was the most important moment in Natasha's life, and something that she and Barton referenced for years afterwards. But they didn't even have any dental records or DNA to confirm either death after the explosion. An explosion that physically scarred Dracov's daughter, and didn't really impact him that badly. By having Dracov's daughter actually survive the explosion, the film cops out of having any real emotional impact for Natasha. She's immediately relieved of her past sins in Budapest, without actually having to do any of the emotional work to get there. The problem solves itself with the reveal. Clearly, the film does not want to emotionally scar the protagonist any further, because neither Natasha or Yelena seem that bothered about murdering all those inmates and prison wardens during Alexei's rescue. This would be a cool way to die. There's also an annoying amount of humour, demonstrating how making a spy thriller fit for the character wasn't really their aim. This can be seen mostly with Alexei and Yelena, who are usually quipping or making jokes. I just got out of prison. I, uh, I have a lot of energy. Oh, please don't do that. He go toilet on my hands. Oh my God. Urine is oh 35 God. degrees Celsius, oh staves off the frostbite. How is this relevant? This makes the film just like all the other Marvel films that fail to stand out or provide something new for the franchise. It also takes away from potential moving and emotional moments because the audience is just waiting for the next joke to break the tension. The family scenes themselves were fine, and they managed to somewhat feel like a bickering disjointed family when together. It's a shame that the humour distracts from that. The bad guy of the film, Drekov, is underwhelming. He just stands around giving orders and hasn't really played much of a role in Natasha's life since she thought he was dead. He doesn't have much of a presence in the film, and then it's revealed the cooler villain, Taskmaster, isn't actually their own person, but Drekov's puppet, whose fate as a villain is left completely ambiguous at the end. The Black Widow film did not have the emotional impact and focus that the previous Marvel spy film, Winter Soldier, had. It felt safe. It wasn't trying anything new to set it apart from the usual roster of Marvel superhero films, apart from having lower stakes and an attempt to focus on family. Overall, this wasn't a terrible film. However, it was not the film that Black Widow deserved after so many years in development. My rating, 5.5 out of 10. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. The first new superhero introduction of Phase 4. Let's go. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings follows a former master of Kung Fu and fighting who has chosen to live a normal life. This doesn't last long since his destiny as the next MCU superhero is calling. Shang-Chi is pulled back into action when he must stop his estranged father from using the magical Ten Rings to open a portal that will destroy their ancestral homeland. It makes sense why this is a good story for an origin. The stakes are low for most of the world, but not for Shang-Chi, as it is his ancestral home at risk from the Dweller in Darkness. It also directly links with his past and troubled family ties, making the story more personal for him. The bus scene is awesome. It's a great introduction early on in the film to showcase Shang-Chi's abilities and fighting prowess, as well as setting up the plot. It suffers a little bit from an overuse of humour, with a man commenting on everything through a livestream, but ignoring that, the scene as a whole is very good, and the fighting is really fun to watch. Try and grade this fight as we're going. The dubstep music makes the scene more engaging, because the fighting and filming is choreographed to it. The world building is also great, and the links to other characters in the MCU, such as Wong and Trevor, feel natural and funny in a way that isn't just a lazy sly wink. Unfortunately, the third act is where things start to drag. Earlier we had snappy and well-paced fight scenes, but the third act falls in line with the Marvel formula of having an action-packed finale. It's a bunch of long fight scenes one after the other that all kind of blend together into each other and get quite tedious. 
The worst part was that the fights were now packed with CGI and visual effects, having huge dragons fight each other or rings thrown back and forth instead of the precise, exciting physical hand-to-hand -hand combat of the earlier acts. Other than the last third, the film was paced really well, and had a good emotional core with the family aspect because the villain, Shang-Chi's dad, actually felt three-dimensional and sympathetic. Shang-Chi wasn't cracking jokes half the time. He felt like someone at the start of his superhero journey, despite already being an accomplished fighter. The film works as an origin story because the audience can see there's still a long journey of learning ahead of him. Overall, it was just a really well-made film. It was still a superhero film, but didn't feel like a lazy rehash of other origin story formulas. I think the filmmaking went a long way in making this familiar formula feel fresh and fun. 8 out of 10 Eternals So here's an example of Marvel trying something a little different, and it not working. Eternals tells the story of a group of super-powered immortals that come to planets to help them grow and thrive. All is fine and dandy until it's revealed that they have actually been priming these planets for eventual destruction. Some of the Eternals are not too pleased about this and set about to stop it. Despite existing for thousands of years around humans, the Eternals tend to act pretty robotic there are 10 of them in total, so to introduce and develop them all into likeable heroes the audience can root for is pretty ambitious. Unfortunately, it's too ambitious for this film. It's not even an issue of screen time, because the film is over two and a half hours long, and its main focus is on Cersei and, by extension, Icarus. Cersei, like so many other Eternals, is really boring. Her whole personality is being empathetic with humans. That's not a personality. One of the biggest problems is Gemma Chan's delivery. Cersei feels off and wooden, despite Chan being an accomplished actress. She feels robotic and awkward. Maybe it's because her character is pretty bland, so there's not much for Chan to work with. They could never do that before. And it was coming after us instead of humans. What's going on? There are some Eternals with potential, helped by strong performances and a charisma that doesn't feel forced. These are Druig, the mind-controlling Eternal who is conflicted through his power as he believes controlling humans is the best way to protect them. I watched humans destroy each other when I could stop it all in their heartbeat. Do you know what that does to someone after centuries? Could our mission have been a mistake? Are we really helping these people build a better world, huh? But, of course, that's an easy route to becoming a dictator. And Thena, the ass-kicking, gold-sword-producing Eternal whose mind has been broken by endless memories. A character that is elevated by Angelina Jolie's nuanced performance. Please. Please, I, I want to remember. I want to remember my life. Athena, I love you, but listen to me. Gilgamesh and Makari, who are somewhat love interests of Athena and Druig, respectively, are also slightly elevated by these connections, but aren't given a lot of time to develop, because more time has to be given to Cersei's boring love interests. The character of Thastos confuses me, because he says his family gives him hope for humans again, but he's hesitant to help the Eternals save the world and give his family a future. Sprite is just kind of around, and then her arc is easily resolved by Cersei using the Unimind power to make her human. However, that works. There's a lack of trademark Marvel humour, but that's not the reason the film is so boring. It doesn't necessarily even have to be a bad thing. In fact, my least favourite character was Kingo, who tries too hard to be funny, and most of his jokes fall flat when Marvel attempts their usual tension-breaking formula through him. Hey, who's your gardener? This film is so slow, you feel every tedious check of the box as they reintroduce each new Eternal in their modern setting and give you a sliver of a clue as to what is actually going on. However, it then has the problem of moving so slowly, each of its character and story issues are highlighted. 
like how the Earth almost being destroyed by a celestial is so high stakes that it would have garnered the attention of every Earthbound superhero immediately, and its effects would ripple throughout the MCU. The film doesn't share the high stakes intensity the characters are meant to be feeling. Instead, it has the same depth and intensity of a good character drama. Minus the good characters. If the characters were better developed and had three-dimensional personalities, I think this film could have been way better. It could have been the something different Marvel was hoping for. 3 out of 10 Spider-Man No Way Home No Way Home is the third MCU Spider-Man film. It deals with the fallout of Peter Parker being outed as Spider-Man and accused of murdering Mysterio from the last film. When Peter asks Doctor Strange for help, the spell goes wrong, and villains from other universes start appearing in the MCU. I love that this film opened exactly where the last one stopped, and it jumped right into the mayhem and fun of the reveal. This is a great sequel, and a really good Spider-Man film. It also introduces the multiverse to the MCU in a really exciting way. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 was my favourite superhero film for many years, having taken that mantle swiftly from the previous Spider-Man film in 2002. So seeing one of my favourite nuanced villains of all time return with the original actor, continuing the same characterization I love? That was huge. Hello, Peter. And I was thrilled to see that No Way Home kept this consistency with the characters it pulled from the other Spider-Man films. There was a high level of attention and care for these characters that I sincerely appreciated. This was made even better by the fantastic performances the original actors brought back with them. Especially Willem Dafoe as the split personality of the Green Goblin, managing to be both chaotic and menacing, and frail and terrified without a hint of parody in his performance. It's kind of amazing how well Dafoe transitioned his character from the sort of campy style of Raimi's films to the more grounded and humorous world of the MCU. As much as I love Doc Ock, there is a reason I get chills every time Goblin's laugh echoed on screen with one of his iconic bombs. The entire sequence in which Peter senses Osborn's turn into the Goblin is fantastically done, and Defoe's performance is key to this, as well as Tom Holland's brilliant acting in return. That's some neat trick. That sense of yours. Norman? Norman's on sabbatical, honey. The hell? The Goblin. And their fight is so brutal and so well choreographed. Defoe's Goblin definitely feels like a worthy foe to Peter. In fact, this film has a lot of fantastic acting and some wonderfully emotional scenes that the film lets play out. <laughs> It doesn't let the typical MCU humour and quips break the tension, and that makes the film more powerful. Andrew Garfield's acting, in those brief moments he refers to the tragedy that concluded his Spider-Man series, is heartbreaking. He forces you to care, because he is just so sincere with every moment he is on screen, and piece of dialogue he has. I lost... I lost Gwen, my, um, she was my MJ. The scenes with all three Peters talking and bouncing off each other in dialogue felt very natural, and it had this friendly, brotherly tone to it that really worked. It could have easily felt like too much and forced, but there was a natural chemistry between the actors and characters that was amazing. Thanks, man. What's that for? Ah, oh, it's my web fluid. It's for my web shooters. Why? Whoa! That came out of you. Yeah. You can't do that, huh? No. How on earth does that even... Anyway, we're getting sidetracked. Look. However, despite all the things that work in Spider-Man No Way Home, 
there are some annoying things that don't. I mean, the plot literally kicks off because Peter is insistent his friends go to MIT immediately after school and not just wait for all the Spider-Man drama to die down. And because he and Doctor Strange didn't bother discussing the specifics and ramifications of this huge spell in advance, and because it never occurred to anyone other than Doctor Strange to just speak directly to the MIT staff, it takes a lot of not thinking to kick off this plot from a lot of people involved, not just Peter. Sometimes the film coasts along on nostalgia. After cheering for surprise cameos, iconic dialogue repeated. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. And meta quips about how weird everything is. A rewatch doesn't really provide that same sense of wonder and excitement. Sometimes it leads to eye rolls because it's a bit lazy pointing out highlights of other films people love. It's also pretty ironic that Spider-Man 3 and Amazing Spider-Man 2 failed by having too many villains and not enough time, and yet Spider-Man No Way Home manages to do it perfectly while bringing in all of them. 8.5 out of 10. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. It'll come as no surprise to anyone who has even glanced at this channel that I was hyped for this film more than any other. It was Wanda's big screen return and it was called The Multiverse of Madness. I think Doctor Strange might be in it too, but I'm not sure. Anyway, it sounded great and I was excited. That's the thing about having high expectations though. Doctor Strange in The Multiverse of Madness has Doctor Strange dealing with the multiverse in a more direct way than in No Way Home, as he's on the run from the Scarlet Witch when she goes after American Chavez, a young woman with the power to traverse the multiverse. My recent rewatch gave me more appreciation for the Doctor Strange side of the story. However, I actually liked his characterization a bit better in Spider-Man, because he seemed more driven and optimistic in that film. But I guess that's the point of this film, since he's fooling himself into thinking he's happy. I'm glad the Christine love story got wrapped up, but the ending kind of ruins the slow, meaningful pace the story took. Doctor Strange parts with Christine for good, and then he suddenly has a third eye and meets a brand new love interest and is jumping into a new adventure. It's emotional whiplash in favour of having a snappy ending and appeal to watch more sequels. There was an interesting plot hook I feel the filmmakers ignored so we could focus on the love story. At the wedding, Dr. West asks, Did it have to happen that way? Was there any other path? No. No, I made the only play we had. Did Dr. Strange choose the best path for the universe or for himself? For his loved ones. The one with the least deaths? What does winning mean to Doctor Strange? This angle could have really emphasised Doctor Strange's arrogance and his need for control and oversight. This conundrum is even hinted at a couple of times. Her sacrifice would be for the greater good? Well, you can kiss the lunchbox goodbye because that's the kind of justification our enemies use. Is it the one you used? When you gave Thanos the Time Stone? And it's shown there were other ways to defeat Thanos, such as with the Illuminati. So this could have been a really intriguing multiverse hook that could make Doctor Strange a bit more complex and selfish in how he feels he needs to handle everything himself. It's only touched on, though, as more time is spent on the Christine storyline. I don't think that the final choice of narrative was a poor choice entirely. However, I think that Sam Raimi actually wasn't the right choice for the film. A different director could have made this work a lot better. Maybe someone similar to Shang-Chi's director, Destin Daniel Cretton. Multiverse of Madness's script wasn't campy or horror-focused enough for Raimi, who's better known for his campy horror Evil Dead series. The bits that had that tone really worked, thanks to his talent there. They were a highlight for sure. This time it's gonna take more than killing me to kill me. My favourite sequence actually had Raimi style 
all over it, with point of view camera shots and eerie sounds. If Multiverse of Madness lived up to its name and leaned more into the surrealist horror, I think this would have worked way better with Raimi's style, while still balancing it with some emotional serious moments for Wanda and Doctor Strange. Instead, it feels like a standard Marvel film, which is getting boring. The audience needs some style, something fresh and different to keep the universe moving forward. So, Wanda. How do I sum up my feelings about making this section over 20 minutes long? Here goes. One of the first things that didn't work for me was Wanda's focus on getting her children back. I just don't believe that she wouldn't have wanted Vision there just as much. He was the reason for her forming the Hex and was part of the Hex that she stayed with till the end, promising him... We'll say hello again. Elizabeth Olsen has said on this subject, The idea really is that the most important thing once you become a mother in the world are your children, and that's why. Well, I think it was really because they didn't want to add more established characters to the story and save on that budget and time. Plus, having Vision around complicates the Scarlet Witch plans to get rid of alternate Wanda and take her place without suspicion. Although my last video on Wanda accurately touched on her villainous turn, I still think it was done too abruptly in Multiverse of Madness. Like, she murders a lot of people. Very brutally. And it basically has to come down to her grief being corrupted by the Darkholds. I don't mind her being a villain, but I'd hope for a more interesting and layered portrayal of the Scarlet Witch. Maybe demonstrating through dialogue and flashbacks how she got corrupted, and if she tried to fight it. It didn't surprise me when articles started coming out about Elizabeth Olsen asking for writing changes to Wanda's character while already on set for the film. I think there's a basic misunderstanding of her character from this movie, and the speed at which they make her a villain. Not even Olsen's last minute notes could get Wanda's portrayal to a point that made complete sense. I wasn't war, and I did what I had to do. You break the rules and become a hero. I do it and I become the enemy. That doesn't seem fair. Overall, Multiverse of Madness was a letdown in a few key areas, but was an okay film that just didn't live up to its premise. Now, if you want a film that really encapsulates what a multiverse exploration should be, please check out Everything Everywhere All At Once. 6 out of 10. Thor, Love and Thunder. In Thor, Love and Thunder, Thor is trying to figure out what he wants to do in life, continuing his arc from Endgame. When Gore the God Killer sets his sights on Thor and Asgard, Thor is shocked to find his ex-girlfriend now also shares the Thor powers, and they have to work together to stop Gore. The film's main faults tend to come from its determination to replicate Ragnarok's silliness and humour. While this worked to revitalise the Thor series and character in Ragnarok, it ends up stalling the character development of Thor in Love and Thunder. Thor has gone through so much trauma prior to this film, and his response to it is to act as goofy and carefree as possible. It's not the Thor we saw in Infinity War and Endgame, and this is meant to be a direct continuation of his story. This change in character seems to just be a way to ramp up the comedy and wackiness to Eleven, because audiences enjoyed it in Ragnarok. But it does a complete disservice to the character of Thor. The film doesn't seem sure what it wants Thor's path to be, which is an issue when that's the point of the narrative. Although Thor is being purposely ignorant to his pain and is trying to avoid strong connections with other people to protect himself, the comedic style of the film and poor writing means the resolution of this character development is never properly addressed. Things just happen to him, like Jane coming back into his life and Gore's daughter ending up in his care. And even then, that feels like a silly ending tacked on to force him into some responsibility. It didn't feel like Thor was making conscious, strong decisions to make a change, but instead these characters appear and he's like, yeah, sure, I'll go with this now. 
The Jane storyline was fine. I did like Natalie Portman's performance and it was really nice to see Jane return in a role that gave her a little more to do than be a passive love interest. I also think her storyline and relationship with Thor had a good bit of heart and was pretty emotional towards the end. I will admit the film was funny and I did laugh a lot, so that does work in the film's favour. It just focused a bit too much on being funny rather than being memorable. Some jokes just fell flat. Like Thor saving a sissy only for it to collapse when its people started to thank him. Or Thor's current weapon, Stormbreaker, being jealous of Jane and Mjolnir, which I never really feel is resolved but forgotten about in the third act. I also hated the fake out of Korg's death only for his head to, uh, hilariously still be alive? The CGI was awful at times, which is inexcusable for a company with so much money. Like, laughably awful for a studio that insists on using a lot of CGI versus practical effects. I've not even seen people touch on how the god Rapu looks like a weird bobblehead when most of his shots could easily have been practical. Overall, on reflection, I just find Love and Thunder pretty lacklustre. This video took me so long to put together that I was able to rewatch it on Disney+, Plus, and I actually enjoyed it less than I thought I would. It doesn't feel as epic or groundbreaking as it should, but it feels messy and confused as to what it wants to be or say. Oh, um, I rewrote this segment twice before my proofreader Mike pointed out I hadn't even mentioned Gor at all. Despite an interesting start, he was just so boring that I forgot he existed. <laughs> Also, they didn't give King Valkyrie her queen after so much lip service towards LGBT romances in a film literally titled Love and Thunder. Come on! 5.5 out of 10. Part 2. Television. WandaVision. Okay, so I already have three videos on my feelings on WandaVision, so let's not rehash old views. I'll keep this one brief. WandaVision focuses on Wanda and Vision. They live various sitcom lives in a reality created by Wanda to repress her grief and anguish at the many tragedies she's experienced, most recently losing the man she loved in Infinity War. The series sitcom parts are the most endearing parts of the show as well as the surreal world of the Hex when it follows Vision and Wanda breaking out of that formula. It's let down a bit by the somewhat boring in comparison sword point of view, as that is nothing on the magic and chaos Wanda is exploiting within her new world. Wanda is portrayed perfectly by Elizabeth Olsen, and I love the emotional journey she goes on. It has some incredibly poignant and meaningful moments that still make me tear up on rewatch. Although most of the characters are great, WandaVision is let down by its one-dimensional stereotype of a villain in S.W.O.R.D.'s director, Hayward. Agatha is wonderful, but also doesn't have enough time to really develop beyond simply wanting to be more powerful than anyone else. All in all, it was a refreshing take on the television format, and really went wild with its premise in a way I'd hoped for to kick off Phase 4. 7.5 out of 10 The Falcon and the Winter Soldier the Falcon and the Winter Soldier takes place six months after Endgame. Sam is still reluctant to take on the Captain America mantle, and a new white Captain America is announced after Sam donates the shield to a museum. Meanwhile, Bucky is dealing with the trauma of his murderous brainwashed history and helps Sam fight a new terrorist group called the Flag Smashers. The series deals with social and political commentary around a black Captain America really well, this was definitely one of the highlights, introducing Isaiah Bradley, a veteran super soldier whose story echoes Steve Rogers, but he was imprisoned and experimented on after his heroics. This is incredibly emotive, especially as the series aired when the Black Lives Matter movement was really kicking off in the United States, making it more relevant than ever. It made Sam's hesitations to take such a public role as a black man more understandable, it also made John Walker, the new Captain America's brutality and violence, more upsetting because it echoed real-life events of excessive violence from police forces. 
The Flag Smashers are a little more nuanced as villains too. They believed the world was better during the blip, due to its open borders. They want to help displaced refugees and use their super soldier abilities to accomplish this violently. I liked that even though they were defeated in the end, Sam still managed to further their goals by ensuring those refugees were not forced back to their home countries. Because the Flag Smashers' motivations were initially very humanitarian and heroic. I do think Marvel vilified them a bit too much. The Flag Smashers were excessively violent and hasty, so the audience would root against them. The series also sees the return of Baron Zemo and Sharon Carter. Zemo is as charismatic and brilliant as his previous appearance in Civil War. I'm glad Sharon got her justice in this series after being forgotten about after Civil War by her allies, but ultimately her role in the series was not that memorable. As a whole, I liked the series, although it did drag at times, and I don't think it had enough content for six one-hour episodes. 6.5 out of 10 Loki Cards on the table, I never got the Loki hype. When he died in Infinity War, I was sad for Thor, but mostly just relieved the endless lives of Loki were over. Well, I spoke too soon. After escaping with the Space Stone in Avengers Endgame, Loki is captured by the Time Variance Authority and eventually has to work with them to fix a greater threat to the current timeline. Loki the series never really captivated me because, again, I'm just not really into the character of Loki. And it's obviously a very Loki-oriented show, featuring him and his many variants. However, the world building introduced was awesome, as well as the eventual setup for Kang's introduction as the big bad villain of the multiverse saga. At times, it felt like a bit of an info dump on the audience as they leaned towards tell rather than show, but it was still the most interesting aspect of Loki for me. Loki's character development, being the stunted Loki from the end of the first Avengers, was done well, and I really liked the scene in which uh, Loki's memories from a future he did not experience were shown, and getting that remorseful, shocked reaction from Loki. Tom Hiddleston's acting is a big reason why Loki is so popular, and Hiddleston did not let down his fans. There was a lot of character development from Loki very quickly, as he transitioned from mischievous anti-villain to a hero. However, again, I'm just not a big fan of the character, so it didn't hit me as positively as it did for a lot of other fans. 5 out of 10 What if? It's not easy to summarise this series of 9 episodes because each episode is mostly standalone. As a whole, the episodes didn't really impress me beyond the very basic premise of exploring slightly alternative universes with one what-if question. Like, yeah, there's a Captain Carter and she basically follows the same path as Steve. Okay. T'Challa would have been a way better Star-Lord than Peter Quill and solved problems seemingly effortlessly. Right. And there's a literal party episode for Thor as an only child that's pretty boring. It's not all meh, though. One episode stood out to me in an extremely impressive way. In this universe, Doctor Strange is in a romantic relationship with Christine, but when he has his fateful crash, he loses Christine instead of crippling his hands. The episode is an homage to the Time Machine story, and has Strange repeatedly try and fail to save Christine that night. He tries to defy all rules of nature by becoming so powerful he can bring her back. When it works, it destroys the universe, and he is faced with what he has done, ultimately losing Christine anyway. It's a devastating and dark ending. This episode is honestly fantastic, emphasised by Benedict Cumberbatch's brilliant voice acting, and it's an episode that stays with you after its bleak ending. This is a 9 out of 10 episode on its own only brought down by the somewhat predictable nature of the homage. When Marvel goes darker, it's rewarding. Which is one of the problems I have with my second favourite episode, which I say hesitantly because I think it could have been way better. The Marvel Zombies episode. They tried to keep it light, such as with Spider-Man's cheery opening, but this is where I really wish they leaned into the horror. I mean, the title invites the idea. 
The series finale, wherein all of the individual multiverse heroes team up, was pretty cool. I like seeing the alternative Ultron winning and think he was a good foe to the heroes. Again, it was fine. I'll watch the second season, as it's an interesting premise, and the standalone episodes mean there could be some stellar stories in the mix. 5.5 out of 10 Hawkeye Similar to Loki, I was never a huge fan of Hawkeye as a character, but I do appreciate Marvel giving some of these sideline characters in the MCU time to develop with their own TV shows. While my opinion on Hawkeye hasn't changed so much, he's fine, not super interesting or engaging, I really liked Kate Bishop and the reintroduction of Yelena Belova in this series. In fact, Kate made me really enjoy this series. Hayley Steinfeld is just very likeable, okay? <laughs> Hawkeye is mainly a setup series for Kate, although it does not push Clint Barton out of the mantle just yet. When Kate <clears throat> borrows Clint's Ronin suit, he is pushed back into the action to protect her from the bad guys wanting revenge. Plus, it's only a few days until Christmas, so there's a running theme of family in the background. There are moments that stand out, such as Clint's reaction to seeing Black Widow in the Steve Rogers musical. Natasha and Clint were close friends throughout the Marvel films, and I love that they open and close the series with Clint mourning her, first at the musical and again when he speaks to Yelena in the finale. I also liked the decision to give him a hearing aid, matching the choice from the comics. His disability does not hold him back from being a badass. It also gives him a valid reason to want to step back a bit from the superhero life, as it's a reminder he's only human and has limited time with his family. I really liked that character decision. Also, Kingpin's back, played by Vincent D'Onofrio from Daredevil. Yes! 7 out of 10. Moon Knight. Moon Knight stars Oscar Isaac playing multiple roles. Well, multiple personalities. Better known as alters within one body. He starts the series as Stephen Grant working in the museum, but eventually Mark Spector emerges, revealing they are the avatar for the Egyptian god Khonshu. Avatars are basically earthly representatives for gods. Meanwhile, Konshu's previous avatar is currently trying to release an old god, Amit, to enact her ruthless judgement on the world. As much as I like Oscar Isaac and the idea for the character, I think this is where my Marvel fatigue was really starting to set in. When Moonlight aired, four movies and five TV shows had been released in just over a year for the MCU. That's an insane release schedule! and a crazy amount of characters and world building introduced. This entire video covers just over a year and a half of Marvel content, so it took a bit more of a push for me to tune in. Anyway, the acting was fantastic, and the characters were pretty great. I really liked Layla and Mark. Arthur Harrow was fine, but didn't really live up to my expectations. His monk-like character ended up feeling less menacing than he should have. The psychological surreal segments within Mark's mind were really good, and I liked seeing some of the wackiness return to the MCU after WandaVision. It wasn't just strange for the sake of it, but done to help the audience and Mark himself understand what's going on. The story wasn't as interesting as the characters, it did drag a bit in the middle, which was emphasised by a great opening episode and then a great finale. I don't feel satisfied by the conclusion for the series because it feels like a setup for more story, which is strange as Oscar Isaac hadn't signed on to more projects when the series premieres. 6 out of 10. Ms. Marvel. Right. I only watched this because the completionist in me needed to for this video. Ms. Marvel follows a teenager in New Jersey who discovers a bangle that unlocks cosmic powers within herself. Kamala learns what it actually means to be a hero, and that it's not as easy and wonderful as she previously imagined. Instead, she is hunted down by government agencies and evil superhumans, while juggling personal and family responsibilities. I was surprised by how much I enjoyed the first episode. I loved the use of animation and graphics to demonstrate Kamala's fantastical mindset, and to literally illustrate her thoughts and plans. 
The humour was good and the characters likeable. Unfortunately, the creativity and wonder of the first episode didn't last. From episode 2, my attention started to waver. I like a balance of human and superhero stories, but Miss Marvel shows that finding that balance is tricky. The series gets a bit too preoccupied with showcasing Kamala's Pakistani culture and family issues, rather than focusing on the Marvel superpowers and stories that most fans would expect. The superhero elements take backstage until the latter half of the series, and sometimes I feel like they're just forgotten about. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean the show is not good, but it does make it feel like less of a Marvel show and more like an everyday team drama. I think this is a bit of a disservice to Kamala as a character. Her previous status as a super fan of Captain Marvel and now having her own powers to deal with is pretty interesting, but the family conflict takes precedence over her internal conflicts. Following the same trend as other Marvel shows, the final episode was a step up from the others, but not to the extent I'd hoped. I love the support Kamala's family gives her, although I do think it stretches reality somewhat as she's still their 16 year old daughter. I think the damage control plotline, despite being one of the main antagonists of the series, was done very poorly. I never understood why they were such a threat. It's not really explained what they want. Are they trying to arrest the superhumans or are they just trying to register them? We met this team in Spider-Man No Way Home, and they came after Spider-Man on a legal basis for allegedly murdering Mysterio. Then they disappeared for the rest of the film. I guess the point is so Kamala doesn't have to reveal her identity, but I really don't understand the actual motivations for the damage control team. Weird considering so much screen time is spent on them. So despite a strong start, Miss Marvel was pretty meh to me. However, Kamala as a character is actually pretty charming and sweet, so I look forward to seeing her again in the Marvels. 5 out of 10 Part 3. The Future Woo! That was a mouthful. So, why am I ripping into these shows and movies? Well, because, for me, Phases 1 to 3 were brilliant. Like I said, it wasn't perfect, but it was exciting and well made for the most part. We've seen comic based franchises come and go since, and Kevin Feige's magic touch is credited with spearheading Marvel into a focused, well executed ride for its fans. So to go from excellent, exciting films to just meh properties that still demand an increased commitment is a huge ask. Phase 4 alone has already surpassed the hours of content within the entire Infinity Saga. Phases 1 to 3 had 49 hours and 56 minutes of content. With the release of Miss Marvel, Phase 4 currently stands at 50 hours and 21 minutes of screen time. I mean, come on, that is insane, right? It seems Marvel is getting ahead of itself on its path to cinematic world domination. So we have quantity over quality because they want to keep expanding and monetizing properties. Kevin Feige is only one person. Let's use Multiverse of Madness as an example here. Elizabeth Olsen came onto the Multiverse set just three days after wrapping WandaVision. Sam Raimi didn't even have the chance to watch WandaVision first and see the details that would be emphasized in post-production. No idea of the reception it would get. But the Marvel train runs full steam ahead, so here we go. And that means some nuances get lost on the way. Likewise, I don't think Multiverse of Madness explained the events of WandaVision well enough for a casual moviegoer. There are some vague references to Westview. Later, you'd show up wanting to discuss what happened at Westview. I made mistakes, and people were hurt. But you put things right in the end, and that was never in doubt. I'm not here to talk about Westview. But no flashbacks or dialogue to explain the plot briefly to someone who missed the series. This seriously limits the people who can see these movies, because Marvel is relying on its audience to do homework. They're making the barrier to access their movies too hard for the casual moviegoer, and that will definitely affect viewership down the line. The audience needs jumping in points within the MCU. Movies or times when a new audience member can join the MCU and not need to watch tens of hours of content to understand what's going on. 
it's really not that hard. Thor Ragnarok was a popular film, breaking box office expectations, and had audience members come along that hadn't tuned into the previous films. But it set itself up so well, you didn't need to. You understood Thor, Asgard, Loki, and that was brilliant. And it didn't feel forced. This was weaved into the story as a natural entry point into the Thor story, but also built enough intrigue to go back and watch the other movies if the audience wanted. Now we have constant references throughout the MCU to other heroes, adventures and stories, as opposed to just within the end credits. A movie or TV show now cannot be standalone. Marvel and its loyal audience demands explicit winks and nudges. And this is to its detriment. Audience members will get bored and stop watching, but Marvel has failed to create new entry points for new ones to join in. Okay, I don't want to brag, but I will. I was in the Avengers. The Avengers? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. What is that? Wait, you don't have the Avengers? Is that a band? Are you in a band? No, I'm not in a band. No, the Avengers is the uh, uh, Earth. Having too much content doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I think it all having to be under one banner is where the issue arises. When Netflix owned some of the Marvel properties, the shows made references to the Avengers Battle of New York, but never directly got involved with the MCU. It felt very street level and in the shadows, which worked really well. However, in the MCU, with everyone meeting and befriending each other, the lines get too blurred on which superhero would deal with a threat, or even what are they doing at the time to prevent them from helping out when things get dire for another one? But if Marvel is going to continue to encourage an incredibly dedicated, detail-oriented fanbase, then they have to be ready for all of these challenges. The films and shows tend to feel more like setup for future stories than one story of its own, because now it's all about the spin-offs. We have to make this universe bigger! Black Widow set up Yelena as the new Black Widow character. Hawkeye had a deaf side character who's now going to have her own solo spin-off series in Echo. Doctor Strange jumped into adventure with a new comics-based love interest at the end of his film. Each film story just feels like an excuse for us to get to the end so the next adventure can be hyped up, as opposed to giving it a slow and deserved finish. It's become too dramatic, all built to drum up clickbait articles on what it means and what happens next, instead of solely being interested in the character's journey going forward. Eternals has felt the most clunky in this regard. By the end of the film, there are six out of the ten original Eternals left, and Earth has been saved. But then... Three of them are kidnapped by Arishem out of the sky! Not that anyone else in the MCU seems to care. But then, Harry Styles and his drunken gnome appear to announce they are going to help the remaining Eternals. But then, we can't forget Cersei's forgettable love interest Dane, who at some point during the film off screen, learned about his destiny as the next Black Knight and now has a magic mystery sword. Yes! Story hooks! Please watch our sequels and spin-offs to figure out what the hell is going on! That's why a lot of the stories have felt meh. It's more about immediate spectacle and intrigue than meaningful storytelling. Love and Thunder being an example of this. It tried too hard to focus on its humour instead of its heart. Making films isn't easy, and Marvel used to be good at it, but now they're getting pretty lazy. I mean, look at these visual effects. This was fun! No! <laughs> Marvel are pushing their visual effects artists to deliver content as quickly as possible. Thor Love and Thunder was a feature length, big budget film, and we still got the cheapest slapdash looking effects. Because they want to ensure they keep to their extremely tight, packed schedules of content. Visual effects artists have actually complained about Marvel's time restraints and demands, which is not a good look for the studio, and really not a good look for their movies. Phase 4 is still not over. 
I haven't seen She-Hulk yet. Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, Werewolf by Night and the Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special are all to be released in the next few months. Even so, I felt like this was a good time to say something because overall, Phase 4 has been pretty meh. In conclusion. So, will I stop watching the Marvel movies? Probably not. Maybe there will come a day when enough is enough. Maybe it's sooner than I think. However, after all this contemplation and criticism, what do I have left? Hope? Hope that Marvel learns from its mistakes and gets back to its exciting, innovative ways? There have been some glimmers. So I'll keep watching Marvel, for now. And maybe even put out some more videos on it. But if Marvel continues this downhill trend and doesn't get better, there will be one last fan watching. And I don't think I'm alone. Oh, one more thing, as I barely knew it existed until I was scouring Disney Plus's Marvel section, but there's this series called Legends that actually does a pretty decent recount of each Marvel hero with backstory before a major release comes out. So that's useful for more casual viewers, I suppose. <laughs>